Hi, this is Paul, and today I'm doing a conversation with a friend of mine. And my friend's name is John Van Donk. And those of you who are paying attention to Vander Clay and Van Donk, who think these are strange Dutch names, well, they are. And I met John on an online community called CRC Voices a couple of years ago or so. John kind of popped into the community, and, and right away he had my attention. He was a, a very interesting individual with a very interesting story. And he, when, I, when my video channel took off, I didn't quite know what to do. And John got very interested in my video channel and said, you got to start a meetup. And I basically said, well, I'll start one if you start one. But the only problem is that I had a video channel that was taking off, so it was quite a bit easier for me to start one. So I am going to be in Southern California on October 18 that evening, and John and I are going to be hosting a joint meetup in Ontario, California. And so I'm excited to have this conversation with John. In anticipation of this, John sent me a, a doc file with basically an outline of his life story, which I had never read before, and I loved it. And so I said, we're gonna do a video, and I want you to tell your story, because part of what I'm backing into with all of my videos is learning the stories of all kinds of different people. And one of the things I discovered about John is John is very much into stories, which we'll get into. So John, thanks for being willing to come on here and, um, I sure appreciate that. Why don't you talk a little bit about how, you know, you discovered Jordan Peterson and what that prompted you to when you started to figure out what he was doing? Oh, that's very simple, actually, because um, you were right there when it happened. <laughs> <laughs> I, I discovered Jordan Peterson uh, from you. I had never heard of the man before, and I was... Uh, um, kind of following our voices conversation and every once in a while you would say well now I found this new guy and his name is Jordan Peterson and here look at this and here look at this and here look at this and see what he says about that <laughs> and and I did and so I, I kind of followed your your lead and and I started to pay attention and then uh, it, it did not take long for me to realize that this man was on to something and and was was about to make a significant impact on on a lot of things, actually. Yeah, yeah. So, so what? So, what caught your attention about him? Well, um, specifically, for me, the most important thing was that he was able to articulate a view of the Bible that I found unique, refreshing. It kind of fit with some things that I'd been thinking about the Bible as the uh, a condensed version of hundreds of thousands of years of, of human stories being condensed and filtered into this unique document that we ignore at our peril. That sentence that he once said, we ignore the Bible at our peril, that just, that just really um, grabbed me in a way because I, had, uh, I have a seminary degree and I have preached a lot of sermons. And I have kind of gotten into the habit of ignoring the Bible. <laughs> so, I'm sorry, I have to admit that. But uh, since I have uh, um, gotten some exposure to Jordan Peterson, I think that um, I think that I'm my, my interest in the Bible is certainly revived. Let's put it that way. Wow. Now, now one of the things that struck me about John almost right away was that. For someone who used to be a Christian Reformed minister, he did not mind going way out on theological limbs. And I, he's, he's still a member of the Christian Reformed Church. He's a faithful member of his congregation, but he is, he is not an ordained minister. And we'll, we'll get into that as we go through his story. But one of the things I really appreciated about John right away was his, his th this guy, John really explores courageously and he's not afraid to follow leads and that's something that i appreciated about john that's not a value that is often esteemed in churches 
or conservative denominations like the Christian Reformed Church, however. So I would imagine that John sometimes gets in hot water here and there, but as G.K. Chesterton said, I like hot water. It keeps me clean. So, <laughs> <laughs> so John, I want to I wanna look at your story a little bit. And now you and I both have these weird Dutch names, but, but my name, Vanderclay, it seems to be a name that some some Dutch Jews made up to pass for Hollanders, but but you come by your name honestly because you were actually born in the Netherlands. I was, yeah. I um, I was born and raised in Holland. I uh, I lived there for the first eighteen years of my life, and um, I'm very Dutch. <laughs> and <laughs> and it's actually with some pride and joy that I um, can say that my youngest daughter uh, last month. Um, obtained her Dutch citizenship on the merits of being my daughter. Wow. Well, <laughs> she was born here, but she now is, uh, her name is Saskia, a very Dutch name, and she now is a Dutch citizen, and as a matter of fact, is in Holland on her honeymoon. Wow. Well, wonderful. Now, yeah. now, now, you said in this little document that your father was a chef and a bus driver, both city and tour, often absent at home, but also an aspiring entrepreneur, uh, like taking risks, and your mother was stay at home and risk aversive. What does that mean, and how did that impact you? Oh, man, that was probably, um, well, the fact that he had that particular occupation often took him away from home, so he was already at an early age an absent father, but when the two uh, got back together, there was always, uh, he always had big plans and dreams about businesses that he was going to start or buy or get involved in and it would involve some some amount of risk and my mother was always deathly afraid of anything that he might undertake and uh, of which she did not know what the end result was going to be so they they argued about it as long as i can remember and uh, eventually i think that that contributed to the demise of their relationship so when i was eight they they did get divorced wow now did both of your parents they lived through world war ii and survived the war yeah, my, uh, my mother has very vivid memories of the hunger winter. She uh, lived in The Hague and uh, was uh, the horror stories that I heard about eating flower bulbs and, and what have you and, and taking all the, the molding off the house to, uh, to keep warm. Uh, so that was her story. And my dad, um, well, yeah, I mean, I may as well say this. When he was 16 years old, uh, he um, he wanted to get a job and he wanted to be a driver he and and, he, and there were no jobs in Holland in that at that time and it was during the war and so he ended up volunteering to drive truck for the Germans oh. wow and so he was driving all around Europe driving a truck yeah. yeah and then after the war and some Dutch people knew that and so he was um, put in a in a in a in a camp for for I think what they would refer to as traitors, yeah, and um, and so he had to uh, jump through some hoops to get out of that camp, and and how how he originally met my mother I don't know, but she became his ticket out of the camp when they when they uh, when they could document that he was going to be uh, well taken care of and and uh, and re-enter into Dutch civilization, um, they let him out. So, so you could maybe see some of the formation. Obviously, there's temperament in both of your parents, but some of the formation, your, your mother survived the war, in a sense, by hunkering down, and your father survived the war by adapting. And yeah. so that's consistent with their personalities, yeah. but also uh, expressive of, their, of what they did. Now, go ahead. This has not actually been, you know, something that I have... Uh, <laughs> admitted to very widely and in some circles to be at all associated with people who uh, were on the wrong side of the war and, and Second World War is, could be a little bit tricky and my credibility among some people might definitely diminish, but yeah. hey, sorry. No, well, <laughs> I had no control over it. <laughs> one, one of the things those of you watching will learn about John, he's very high in openness and he's very honest. And that's, that's what gets him head hot water sometimes, but that's also what keeps him clean. So <laughs> now, now you mentioned that your parents divorced. How did that impact your life? Did you live with your mother then? Well, yeah, I, my dad had already actually disappeared and the, and the divorce was a formality at that time. But at age eight, uh, I was 
um, living with my mom and, and they formalized a divorce. And I actually didn't see him much more until way later in my life. Um, but for that, for that initial period, I was living with my mom and my mom really did not, was not able to contain me, you might say, be able to set, set proper boundaries. So there were all kinds of situations where there was one, there was one time when I, when I apparently uh, um, became a little bit too inquisitive with the neighbor girls and the neighbors all got together and, um, and they, they, they told my mother that it was really important that I be out of the neighborhood. And if she wasn't going to make it happen, then they were going to make it happen. So in the end, they ended up asking a local farmer if he would please take me under his wing and, and, and take me to his farm, especially in the summertime, um, because they really didn't want me around their kids. And so he did, to his credit, I might say. And, um, and he, he also had a very good way with me. He, 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 he kind of picked up that there were some things that I really – uh, wanted to do and and uh, he he kind of held that back and he he let them be carrots for my for my uh, compliance in other areas so he says okay you want to you want to drive the horse and wagon that's fine we'll, we'll let you do that down the road but first you have to prove yourself uh, with x amount of stall cleaning and 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 more mundane work so he he did that for several years and i think that you know my, 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 that was my introduction to agriculture, and it actually has had a significant role in the rest of my life along the way in various ways. So. Yeah. Now, now, part of your, the theme of, of you know, what we're talking about is fatherhood. And so, you know, you probably ha don't have a lot of memories of your biological father in your life, but it sounds like this, this farmer who took you in kind of in some ways acted as a father to you to teach you how to work and teach you some virtues and... Is yeah. that fair? So that, that's fair enough, but I don't know if you read that article that I once wrote in the banner about that. Uh, we can get into that right now if you like. Um, the truth of the matter is that my dad leaving um, simultaneously opened up some doors for me um, to get into this agricultural life, but it also opened up some opportunities for mischief. So at age 13, I ended up in a, in a, in a, in a boy's home, um, just shy of the uh, youth authority, you might say. Uh, that was always a threat that was held over our heads if you didn't behave, and the next step was the, uh, the youth authority. And, and so I, I, I managed to make, a, make my way in the world, both with immigration and, and with schooling and with employment, but there was always this nagging sense that there was something wrong with me because I did not have a dad. Mm. And so I, I ended up exploring that in various different ways. I remember uh, having a conversation about that with Andrew Banstra back in seminary. Mm -hmm. You might recall him. Yeah, and he, was, he had some wisdom about the subject. But, but eventually, and in the end, I, I ended up... Um, coming across a man named Richard Rohr. He's a Catholic priest. Uh, he has a, 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 some kind of a center in, in New Mexico called the Center for Action and Contemplation. But he also had a vision for, uh, for men's initiation. He wrote about that in his book, From Wild Men to Wise Men. And, uh, and I read that book, and it was kind of intriguing. Hmm. And then I began to keep myself informed about where these various initiation rituals were happening. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, one was happening in um, Occidental, uh, in Northern California, in your neck of the woods there, uh, towards um, um, Bodega Bay there in that area. And I signed up and was accepted, and I went for a one-week men's initiation ritual there that, that proved to be quite intriguing in so many different ways. Mm -hmm. And uh, among the things that he did was he kind of had guys act out the, the the basic foundations of the gospel. You know, there there was a there was a lot of uh, painting with red paint on your shirt, and there was a lot of wailing and moaning and crying about the pain of our brokenness. And, and there was a dunking in water so as to symbolize the 
the, the buried with Christ into uh, into death. Mm -hmm. And then there was a some kind of a anticipated resurrection, but they were kind of vague about that. We carried <laughs> naked bodies around as as though they were they were corpses. There were there was all kinds of weird symbolism there, but somehow it created a kind of an openness to to the ultimate experience where where we were all sent into the into the woods. This was a, an area that was surrounded by amazing uh, redwoods. And so uh, on Saturday morning, uh, we, we were given a sack lunch and, uh, and, and some instructions. And, uh, and I took my knife and, uh, and a flashlight and some water bottles. And I had earlier found this particular grove, um, some redwood trees that grow in a circle. I think they call it the a witch's nest or something like that where the center one had died and all the saplings around it had grown up so there is this circle of uh, of redwoods and I found myself a spot there and uh, and there I sat I think I was there at eight o'clock in the morning and I uh, twiddled my with my knife I twiddled a stick I, I, I carved some some designs in a stick and I took a nap and uh, sat there and thought some more. And I kind of like things to happen fast. I, I am a, kind of an action-oriented person, and nothing was happening. So I, I said, well, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, I, I forget to mention that the, this, this priest, when he sent each of us off into the woods, had said, you will experience the change that changes everything. And, and, and somehow I believed him. And I walked into the woods and I sat there for a long time and nothing was happening. And then I, um, actually I took another nap. It was all the way till two o'clock in the afternoon that I, 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 I took up my notepad and I, I wrote down, well actually I, I was thinking, why could so-and-so not have been my dad? Mm. And I thought of another name. Why couldn't he have been my dad? That would have been good if he had been my dad. Yeah. And, and then I thought of another man in my life. And I says, how come so-and-so couldn't have been my dad? Mm. And this, this whole thing started snowballing. And mm. pretty soon I had, I wrote those names down. And pretty soon I had a list of 14 names mm. of men who had, in some form or another, been influential in my life. I mean, taught me how to work. I mean, there was one guy in British Columbia, his name was Bill Hogovine. He gave me a seat at his table and my own cup. And he says, this is your place and this is where you belong. And all your other kids move over. This is John's spot. And that made wow. an incredible impression on me. Wow. And there were other people that taught me uh, other specific things, guys that gave me a sense of how to buy stuff. His name, his name is Joe Grass. He lives in Bellflower. And uh, there, were, there were just a whole long list of people who had had a very positive influence on me and and I looked at that list and all of a sudden the light went on God had given me better fathering in my life than many men had received from their fathers who live with them every day yeah. and it was a it was a mind-blowing experience mm. and it uh, and it 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 completely, I, never again since that day did it ever occur to me that I had somehow missed out on, on good fathering. Mm. I never again had this, this sense that there was something missing in my life. Mm. It was a, 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 an incredible realization that, um, that, that I was okay, that that, that, peace was, uh, that peace was taken care of, and God had found a, a rather unique way of making it all happen. Wow. And it actually went so far as that about a month ago, this was kind of an interesting uh, little outcome of that. Somebody um, rode with me in the car. We went to a concert in the, at the Hollywood Bowl, and, and this person says, wow, John, I really appreciate the way you drive. Oh, I said, well, I have my dad to thank for that. Hmm. I have my dad to thank for that. And this is now my natural dad we're talking about because once upon a time, uh, many years later, I went back to Holland. I had reestablished contact with him. I went there for my honeymoon and he let me use a car and I think he wanted to find out what kind of a driver I was. So he, uh, he took me to visit somebody and, and I was driving and, 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 he, and I said to him, I said, there's a standard uh, 
Toyota with a stick shift. And uh, I said, well, what do you think? And, and, and he says, well, he says, you won't get very many tips. <laughs> so, so then my dad explained that when he was uh, a tour bus driver going from Holland to Innsbruck and Salzburg in, in Austria, he would have a carload of old ladies, you know, and, and, or a bus load. And he says, the old ladies, they want to be in the bus, but they don't want to know that they're moving. <laughs> they don't want you to take the curves too fast. They don't want you to stop very suddenly. They want everything to be smooth. And if you do that, then by the time they get off the bus at the end of the, of the trip, they will tip you nicely. <laughs> and if you don't drive that way, then they won't tip you nicely. So he said to me, John, he says, if you adjust your driving so that it is, sorry, so that it is smoother, then you will get more and bigger tips. <laughs> so, so I said that to this person who commented on my driving. I said, well, I have my dad to thank for that. And then it occurred to me that I had never said to anyone in my whole life anything positive that I had received from my own biological father. Wow. And then I realized that 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 ugly scar of of wondering why I didn't have a dad had been removed and now he could take his place among the other guys. Yeah. As someone who had been part of my fathering experience. Yeah. And it was actually kind of a kind of a cool realization to uh, to experience that. Nice. So that I, see, this is why I wanted you on, because <laughs> I know you're a great storyteller and you've got great stories. And, you know, it's, you know, one of the things about Jordan Peterson that people have talked about, well, he, he's, he helps people with daddy issues. Okay, well, people with daddy issues don't need help. Um, you know, that's not dismissive, but you've, um, that's, that's just a powerful story that you have. And but now you, you've had a lot of twists and turns in your life. And so you're in the Netherlands and, and how did you, how did you get over, how did you get over the Atlantic and how did you become a Christian reform minister? Wow. <laughs> well, um, I managed as a result of my um, exposure to agriculture to uh, get a few jobs in in Holland, also when I went to the youth home, I was I was working on on dairies, and that whole thing. I was on the academic track. I was smart enough to be in the academic track, but I really wasn't applying myself very well, and and got horrible grades. And so I asked to be transferred transferred to the uh, more technical, in this case, agricultural track, which, from a status point of view, is probably not as as good as the academic track. And, but if you're failing in the academic track, then the status doesn't really amount to much. So I, I did really well in the agricultural school. And um, the academic standards of which we should return to down the road sometime. Um, but I got really good grades and, and they offered to people with really good grades upon graduation, they offered the opportunity to go on a, on a on a student exchange program to Canada for nine months and to have some experience with progressive farmers over there and, and learn some, some new ideas about how to farm, which Holland, of course, is steeped in tradition and a lot of that was uh, unknown to the people there. So I went there, but um, at the time, this is kind of a weird thing. Um, at the time, up until that point, people who came to Canada as exchange students uh, could get insurance, but people who immigrated to Canada could not get the national health insurance for the first year. So, so students were insured, but immigrants were not. And so every year this organization was able to send 60 students abroad because they had 60 student visas. Well, in 1969, when I came over, that was the first year that, that immigrants could be insured on the national health plan within the first year of their arrival, or actually immediately upon their arrival. And so this organization 
always had more applicants than they had visas. So they started giving immigration visas, immigrant visas, permanent land and immigrant status visas to the extra applicants. So they had 60 student visas, visas, 67 applicants. I was one of those seven and I got the landed immigrant status in Canada without even asking for it. So, <laughs> so, so when it was time for me to go back, I said, well, is there any really good reason why I should go back? And I decided, no, there wasn't. And I stayed there, except for the girlfriend that I left behind. She was not too happy. <laughs> And my mother, I think my mother also would have preferred for me to come home. But. Yeah, yeah. So, so you were you were in Canada and you're learning ag stuff, and you had an immigrant visa, so you stayed. So, you yes. just did farm work then. Well, I also am a um, already back in Holland. I was milking for the what is called in Holland the Boerenhulpvereniging, which means a uh, an agricultural uh, organization to assist farmers, usually one man operations, when there are issues and they can't milk their cows. So it's kind of an emergency relief milking organization. And I, and I was a member of that organization. So already while I was in school, I was sent out on various and sundry emergencies. Uh, you, you, you were called, you know, you get a phone call. Or, or the, actually, my teacher was the one who, who got the phone call. And they told me, after school, go there and there and milk that person's cows because, uh, well, he's sick and he's in the hospital or in, in several cases, uh, he's died. One guy got killed by the bull. So go milk his cows. His widow is at the funeral home and blah, 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 blah. And so you go there and there's nobody there. There's cows, there's equipment, and it's time to milk. So, John, figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> so I learned how to do that fairly well. And then when I went to Canada, I started doing the exact same thing. And so I got myself a bit of a reputation as a relief milker. And people trusted me with their cows, and so that was quite lucrative. And I and I also for men, I greatly enjoyed it. I loved working um, that particular way because it was constant change. I was here for three weeks because they went and picked up their car in Detroit, and I went there because they went back to Holland for the first time in their life, and I was milking their cows. So people were very grateful to have somebody like myself uh, in the area, so that they all started planning their vacations as soon as I got there. Well, well, how did you wind up um, with a call to the ministry and getting a, then getting back on the academic Ooh. track? Oh, uh, yeah, 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 that's right. Because you're, so you're out there milking cows. And for those of you who don't know the Christian Reformed Church, that's not an uncommon story. Actually, my mother's side, so my father's side were Jews, you know, sneaking out of the Netherlands for reasons we don't know. But my mother's side were Frisians who got imported with Frisian dairy cows to Mr. Whiten in Whitensville, Massachusetts. So they're the, they're the two sides of my family. But yeah. so, you're, so to be CRC and milk and cows is not an unusual thing. No, and, and, and when I signed up with the organization to be a, an agricultural student exchange program, and then you mentioned to people that you kind of like to milk cows because they ask, you know, what, what do you want to do? And they told me right away, if you want to, if you want a future, if you want to hub up and rub shoulders with successful dairy farmers, go to the Christian Reformed Church because that's where you'll find them. <laughs> so, I, so I dutifully went to the Christian Reformed Church to rub shoulders with successful dairymen, and it was also a marketing scheme for me to, you know, get no more customers for my, for my fledgling um, relief milking business. And then I was in a particular church for a few months, and... I actually was boarding with this particular family and they got a divorce hmm. and it was kind of an ugly divorce and the whole church was in, in uproar about it and they took sides. So half the church was uh, loyal to him and the other half was loyal to her and it was the ugliest thing you've ever seen. And, and it brought back all kinds of memories for me about my own parents' divorce. And I said, you know, this is not really a good enough reason for me to be in church. And I have, I have, I have other ways that I can promote my business. So I vowed that I was going to never again set foot in church. <laughs> I was done with it. I was going to quit and never again set foot in church. Well, <laughs> man proposes and God disposes. So... 
a neighbor of mine who uh, knew that I was, um, I had moved to, to, to a different dairy. I was, on a, I was managing a dairy for somebody else and uh, I was kind of new there and I was still driving back and forth to this other place. And that's when I decided I wasn't going to go to church anymore. So then his neighbor shows up and he says, uh, so John, um, how are you? Well, you know, my name is August and um, tell me about yourself and blah, 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 very friendly guy. And then he says, well, says, the main reason I'm here is that this Saturday we're going to have a church picnic at Cultus Lake. This was in uh, near Chilliwack or Abbotsford. And he says, we're, we're, we're going to have a church picnic there. Oh, yeah. And, and, and in the course of the conversation, I had told him that I was pretty much done with church and that I was never going to sit foot in church anymore. And so he says to me, well, on Saturday we're going to have this church picnic. So can I pick you up uh, and take you along to the, to the church picnic? And I says, you didn't hear what I said. I said, I wasn't going to have anything to do with church anymore. Yeah, I says, but that's church. I mean, this is a church picnic, something totally different. <laughs> I mean, the genius of that invitation, we should pay attention to that. <laughs> you know, <laughs> That's not really church. It's just a picnic. It's I know. <laughs> games. No, yeah, I know, but the entire <laughs> church was there, <laughs> including the preacher. <laughs> And so, and so, um, we, we, uh, I let myself get talked into it. And so on, on, on Saturday morning, he picked me up and I went to the church picnic and, um, I, I, I'm a fairly outgoing kind of person. I can converse with people. And if there are people there to converse with, I will converse with them. And I met this preacher. His name is Marvin Hybor. He is, uh, I think he's living somewhere in the desert right now. I've kind of lost contact with him. Maybe I should chase him down one of these days. But uh, he said, um, oh, yeah, nice. Yeah, great story, you know? And we kind of talked about different things, about cows and about why I wasn't going to come to church anymore. He says, and he just ignored it. He says, yeah, well, I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> and much to my amazement, the very next Sunday, after I had decided I was never going to go to church again, the very next Sunday, I find myself in church. You can't make this stuff up. And so it occurred to me that there was something happening. It occurred to me that I had a whole lot less control over my own life than I thought I did. And I ought to, and we ignore that stuff at our peril. <laughs> 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 so, so then I... Um, I, I, I went to church, and, and unlike all the other times that I had gone to church when most of my time was spent either taking a nap or trying to figure out who I was going to corner after church to see if I could drum up some more business, um, I ended up paying attention to what the preacher was saying, and I ended up paying attention to what was happening, and why are we doing this, and what's going on here, and what is this about, and, and, and somehow God got a hold of me and things started to change in my perspective and my my uh i think that a little bit of faith grew in my in my heart mm -hmm. so well then i you know I, I i'm i'm also the kind of person then if i'm going to do that then i'm going to go pretty much gung-ho all the way <laughs> yeah and, well I, I i joined the youth group and i went to catechism classes and and, and then i I kind of thought that this guy's job was a whole lot more fun than my job milking cows. And so, <laughs> so, so I, uh, at one time, fairly early on, I, I, I went over to his office and I says, you know, what do, what do I have to do to become a preacher like you? And he just laughed and he laughed like you laugh that loud. <laughs> and he says, well, why don't you go back to milking cows for a year and we'll talk again next year. So, I, I, I kind of understood what he meant, and, and it was kind of impulsive on my part to want to, you know, change that quickly. But that whole following year, I, I, I kept that thought in my mind, and I kept reading up, and I kept paying attention, and I kept preparing, and I kept, and then I, and then in September of the following year, I says, well, I think I'm, I think I would like to, I think I would like to go to school to, uh, to become a pastor. And I think it took a week from the time that I came up with that till when he had all the ducks in a row for me to be accepted at Kelvin 
in those days it was a whole lot easier apparently and i i had a i had a little car and i i uh, had some riders that helped pay the gas and we we drove all the way to michigan and uh I enrolled at Kelvin, and the rest is history. Kelvin College or Kelvin Seminary? Kelvin College, yeah. This was Kelvin College. I, I only had a high school degree at the time from an agricultural school, but amazingly, to my amazement, I got all kinds of credit for science courses and what have you. So apparently, <laughs> Kelvin College really appreciated the Dutch agricultural uh, schooling system uh, for whatever that was worth. So... So, Anyways. so you, well, that's a, that's a long haul to do college and then the seminary. So then you were a student for a while. Seven years. I was in Grand Rapids. Okay. And when did you meet your first wife? Third year. Um, in the fall of my junior year, she showed up okay. and, uh, it was love at first sight. And, uh, so she was also very Dutch and appreciated my Dutch quirks. And, uh, and so, yeah, we hit it off pretty good right away. Okay. And uh, we ended up graduating together, but didn't even bother going to graduation. We were already flying west, so, okay, to get so, married. All right, so you got married, and did you get married while you were in seminary or after? No, 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 well, right after college, we got married right after college, and we had, I had read that verse in the Bible that if a soldier gets married, who should he should take a year off of, it being a soldier, and I says, well, I mean, being a soldier for the Lord is kind of like that, so we should take a year off of school to kind of get used to each other and, and do a little traveling. We, we had some romantic notions about what we were going to do. We were going to go work a few months and then, and then travel around Europe for a year. Instead, we worked for nine months and traveled around Europe for three months, but it was still pretty good, you know? I mean, we, yeah. we, we had a fun time. So. Okay. So then you returned and you finished, you did Calvin Seminary and how did Seminary? I started, I started at, I started at Calvin Seminary. I, uh, I, I managed to make it through that intro Hebrew thing. And I, uh, I started at, I started at Calvin and, uh, Doreen also started at Calvin at the same time and was one of the first female students at that time. We were there together with Marcin Reinstra and, wow. and those guys and Winnie yeah. Klopp. So we were some of the pioneers of, uh, of uh, female students. And she always got better grades with Bass Van Elder than I did. It was kind of an irritating thing. <laughs> 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 but, but at seminary, it was just like in college. I was never very concerned about grades. I was more concerned about the experience. You know, whatever, whatever is good enough to get me to the next step is, is fine. But then she found out that, that the kind of degree that she wanted to pursue was offered at Fuller Seminary in California, and, and, and she had been told that she could complete her degree in one year. So we made plans to move to Pasadena for one year, and she would finish her degree, and then we would both go back to Kelvin, and I would finish up, and, and all would be well with the world. But there was a change in uh, administration and ownership at Fuller Seminary, and the new director of the program kind of expanded things a little bit, and uh, she could not finish it in one year, but it was kind of uh, sprung on her at the last minute that we would have to be there two years. So during the course of the first year, I took a couple of electives at Fuller and found them to be so enjoyable that I ended up going to Fuller full-time after I cleared with Calvin, that they would um, still recommend me for ordination without having to do the year of penance, which is designed so that the faculty can make an informed recommendation to the Board of Trustees. After I had been at uh, Calvin for two years, they figured they know enough of me and they didn't really need to see me again. <laughs> All right. So you finished up your degree at Fuller and then yeah. you were a candidate? Then I was a candidate. I want to say something right here that, that might be of some interest to our preacher uh, um, colleagues here, um, because Kelvin provided an excellent academic foundation for my for my uh, for my schooling for my academic pursuits. But Fuller made it all come come to life. Hmm. Hmm. Of course, I, I I had done all my core work already at Kelvin, and I could take a lot of uh, electives. So it's probably a false comparison to think that, um, you know, it was such a fun school to go to because I had all these fun courses to take. But, but I think that if, if, if at Kelvin they really concentrated on the fundamentals, 
and uh, making sure you get your head on straight. At Fuller, they really did a great job, I thought, um, inviting people to use their gifts for ministry and explore what that all meant. Mm -hmm. And uh, the program is so broad and there were so many opportunities and it was a big seminary and so many people from so many different places. And I remember arguing with uh, some Methodist guy, a friend of mine, and he was taking the reform side and I was taking the Armenian side and, and we had great fun. With that. <laughs> so I think he was ultimately convinced I was not so much. So. <laughs> so, but anyway, yeah, I met, I met friends there that, that are still, you know, part of my life right now. Yeah. Wow. So. Wow. And yes, then I was, um, I was uh, declared eligible for candidacy and I became a youth pastor in, in Hayward, California. But in the meantime, I had also learned a little bit about industrial chaplaincy. And I, I, I understand that right now there are some industrial chaplains floating around in the Christian Reformed Church. They think that they invented it, but they didn't because I did. <laughs> <laughs> what is an industrial chaplain? Well, if people don't come to church, then maybe the church ought to go to the people. And following the model of the French worker priests who uh, worked alongside the poor and the, see what happens is in very many work situations, you don't quite get the 40 hour work week. You basically sell your soul to the company and, and um, you have to, you know, spend many, many, many hours working and often on, on the Sabbath also. So then instead of um, same models with the military, I mean, if you're, if you are confined to a location by virtue of your job and you want to worship somewhere, then the least your employer could do is make opportunities available for you to be able to worship. And that's how the military, of course, does their chaplaincy. If you're confined to a hospital, then it would be nice if there were opportunities to worship there. That's how hospital chaplaincy first started. If, uh, if you're confined to a prison and you are um, not able to go anywhere, then there are prison chaplains that uh, help you with your spiritual needs. And that same concept was explored in various ways in France and in other places on, in an industrial context. And also um, there were some, there was an organization, the National Institute for Business and Industrial Chaplaincy, and I was one of their charter members way, way back then. Um, in the south, I think it was in uh, Waco, Texas, that we used to have our meetings. And so I, I kind of introduced that concept to uh, to Hal Bodie, who was the director of chaplaincy at the time, and he was kind of intrigued by it and wanted to fund it so that it would be developed. And so uh, when I came to Hayward, they put half of my salary uh, came from the chaplaincy, and that made it a little easier for the church to afford me. I was a half-time youth pastor and half-time industrial chaplain. And my job was to uh, to figure out how I could establish a relationship with local industry and did so, except that that was also in the early 80s when the economy kind of tanked. And so there were not that many people who were that eager to add additional employee assistance services to their uh, benefit package. Um, and as soon as the economy picked up, then the uh, health maintenance organizations um, became more prominent and companies engaged them for their benefit packages and that's when Kaiser grew and chaplains really were on the end of the line at that point. Mm -hmm. Chaplaincy never really took off in the same way that I had originally envisioned it. Oh, I, that's a whole thing I didn't know anything about. I should note for those of you who are not Christian Reformed, if a Christian Reformed person says Sabbath, they mean Sunday, not Saturday, as the Jews and Adventists do. <laughs> That's a little bit of inside CRC stuff there. Yeah. So you were in you were in Hayward, and you were in Halifax, Nova Scotia, and Grand Ledge um, near Lansing. So you moved around a bit. Yeah. Um, my my stint as a church planter in Halifax um, was. Uh, basically a concession from home mission to the urgent demands of a small minority in the church there that thought that the church ought to move away from the campus because there wasn't much campus ministry happening and the church was too small all the time. So they said, well, let's start another church in the inner city. But um, as soon as I arrived, uh, about 
half a year later, the, um, the pastor of the other church took a call elsewhere. And then, and the new person who came, uh, had a different style of ministry and was much more accommodating and much more willing to relinquish that tiny little building by the university and instead, um, rented the big Methodist church that I had, uh, or United church, I think it was that I had, uh, gotten a hold of in the North end. And so that church flourished there mm. and uh, they don't really, didn't really need me anymore at that point. So, okay. Okay. um, and then home missions took me back to, uh, send me to Grand Ledge. My, my ministerial career is nothing to write home about. There's nothing terribly, uh, noteworthy there about, uh, my great career as a CRC pastor, but somehow it got in my blood and I still think of myself as a pastor somewhat. Well, I, my ministerial career is nothing to write home about either. So <laughs> just got a missionary and then one, one little insignificant church. But so, but now you are no longer. But you have staying power. I, that's, that's one thing that my father and I, we have that in spades. He was 36 years in Patterson. I'm only 21 years here. We're just getting started. So yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, but now you're no longer a CRC pastor and I got in. So if you are willing to tell that story as you've shared it with yeah. me. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that, that's, it's a, it's a kind of a significant part of the whole thing because, um, when I was, um, in Lansing, um, my then wife Doreen was given the opportunity to start a satellite clinic of Bethesda hospital, which at that time was in Denver. Bethesda Christian Hospital, Psychiatric Hospital, and they were eager to start various satellites around the West Coast, and they wanted somebody in uh, Southern California to uh, to, to uh, spearhead that, and she was fully qualified for that at the time. So she took that opportunity, and we moved to Bellflower, and um, I was Mr. Mom. I took care of my daughters for three years full-time and loved every minute of it. It was one of the highlights of my life, and it, it created a kind of a bonding with my daughters that I would not have otherwise gotten in the same way that I did. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I am the chief, the chief diaper changer, even with my grandchildren. Mm -hmm. Diaper changer, even with my grandchildren. Mm -hmm. So anyway, um, then I think that that Doreen had already kind of. Um, had a sense, I don't know if you've ever read that book, uh, Peter Scazzetti or whatever his name, The Emotionally Healthy Church. He describes in the preface that um, he came home one evening and his wife said, if you don't go and tell your elders what you're like at home, then I will. <laughs> and so he did. And that was the beginning of his emotional health journey. And he was a better pastor on account of it and wrote the book on emotionally healthy churches. I think that Doreen may have made attempts for me to uh, get that same message, but it didn't sink and it didn't register. And so she didn't think that I was really pastor material in the same way that the church needed. And so when it was time for me to go back to work, um, she, she became pregnant with her third daughter and, and it was time for me to go back to work. and. Uh, and so she said, you can take a call anywhere and to any church anywhere, but I'm not moving. That's kind of a, kind of a message that yeah. means, you know, your, yeah. your ministerial career is going to be somewhat limited, yeah. buddy. Yeah. And so I got the, I, I got the, the message and I think that it's hard to know what are all the subconscious little messages that go on in your head, but when your wife says something like that, then you say, well, this is probably not a battle I should fight. And so I, I voluntarily walked away from it. Uh, at the time, there was a rule in the Christian Reformed Church that if you didn't, weren't associated with a particular congregation um, or had a sabbatical for study or for illness or for whatever, um, for three year, you got a three-year reprieve. And so they granted me a three-year reprieve and then I had to either um, fish or cut bait, and I uh, kept on fishing. And so they decided that um, there was time to to uh, separate me from, or to lapse my ordination. Basically, there was no yeah. misconduct. It was just right. it was it wasn't happening. So right, right, right. Yeah, and then all kinds of other 
opportunities arose. I sold, I sold computer software for a while and, and a few other things. Um, but then somebody in the church that I was attending at the time had purchased a large dairy in Chino, and they asked if, I, if, if they would be taking me away from my ministerial calling if they offered me the job to manage that dairy. I said, I don't think so. I think that my ministerial days are pretty well over, so I think that I would be very pleased to uh, accept that, that challenge and uh, take that job. So I did that, and um, it was really quite fascinating for me because I had been used to a lot smaller dairies and where I had to do a lot of the work myself. In this case, it was more a managing of other people but also to you know know cows well enough to know what's up and what's down and so I, I I did I was very successful I did very well there and I was appreciated by my employer so um, but but I I may have also um, dove into that job with a little bit too much enthusiasm um, our marriage did not last and six months later my my uh, my wife left me. Mm. Mm. And I can talk at length about, you know, what I contributed to the demise of that marriage. It was definitely a wake-up call for me. Yeah, yeah. And so I, I realized all kinds of things about myself that, that, that I had been blind to up until that point. Yeah. Um, but the damage was already done at that point, and yeah. there was no going back. Yeah. So then you're, you're – so now you're, you're not a minister, and you're not a husband – and well you've got a job and the family's now the divorce is not only is fatherhood a big theme in your life but divorce is a big theme in your life yeah and and um the one thing that did continue was my parenting my mm -hmm. my wife sufficiently appreciated my parenting uh skills and and enthusiasm and uh capabilities, I guess, that she never hesitated to have the girls spend as much time with me as, as we could organize. And so um, the kids were with me quite, quite a bit, especially uh, on weekends and in the summers. And so they talk about themselves as being raised um, on the dairy. And then a few years later, my um, Doreen remarried and then Mm. moved to within 10 miles of where I lived and the high school and the elementary school and the junior high school were all right in between 5.6 miles each way. Mm. And uh, it was kind of an amazing little mm. factoid that it was the exact same distance from my house to the school and from her house to the school. Yeah. And, uh, and there was a, and there was a, a, a little set of hills between her house and my house. And I remember at one point during a Thanksgiving service at our church saying that it felt like those hills were getting lower. Hmm. There was a real a sense of being able to talk with each other again and, and co-parent. And we uh, they even started attending the church that, I was at at the time, much at the request of the kids, of course, they wanted everybody to be together. So sure. um, we would walk into church sometimes and they'd be there with their mom and her new husband. And then they would insist that we come sit by them. Mm. And then uh, when we, when I was there on a Sunday with the kids, then they would insist that they would come and sit by us. So we had this long pew of, of two sets of divorced parents <laughs> and the kids in between. And it was, it's kind of an amazing thing. And then at one point the kids also said, okay, well, we're all done having this um, dinner in two houses, you know, Thanksgiving dinner at mom's house and Thanksgiving at dad's house. That's bullshit. We're not doing that. Oh yeah. Edit that out, I guess. Uh, we're not doing that. <laughs> we're not doing you can that. say that on YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> we're not doing that anymore. So if you guys want to have us over for Thanksgiving, you better organize it all in one house and that's that. Wow. And so we complied and it turned out to be the beginning of a, of a long stretch of, uh, of a very fruitful cooperation and, and uh, kind of a reconciling thing of, of forgiveness and reconciliation and, and a renewed connection as parents. And, and we enjoy that to this day. I mean, it's really kind of a wonderful thing. 
Wow. So yeah, I'm on the dairy. I'm parenting. My kids are there regularly. And um, then about a year later, um, I got this new veterinarian. She was female, and I. The rest is history. <laughs> <laughs> but she, but she, um, she was of Catholic background, and had been faithfully attending the Catholic church in town, and uh, kind of took me to uh, a singles group at her church. Uh, this was before we were married, and um, and that singles group actually was uh, they were attempting to be uh, a, a, a divorce recovery group of sorts and it was a little bit mickey mouse and haphazard and not really moving very nicely and so i don't exactly know exactly how it all came about but i ended up being one of the leaders of that group and and we we were able to give it some content and it became a kind of a powerful healing ministry for divorced people hmm. and my starting point was always we're all failures here together hmm. you wouldn't be here if you were happily married yeah we're all failures i don't care who you blame whether you blame your your ex or blame yourself we're all failures here together but and then i yeah <laughs> i forgot to tell you about that when Doreen first left i uh, that was such a shock for me that for for uh, about two week period, I walked around every waking hour with this little uh, statue in my hand. I don't know if you can see this. Mm -hmm. And I clutched it like it was a lifeline and it was the, the physical thing that kept me somewhat sane as though um, I still was held in the palm of God's hand. It was a completely irrational notion, but somehow it was firmly lodged in my soul and it stuck. And so when I began this divorce recovery ministry, I always, at the end of every meeting, I put this little statue in the middle of the room, in the middle of the circle, and I read Isaiah, you know, that God has carved this on the, and, 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 and yeah, this is kind of beautiful. Because these are all divorced people. And so I would say to them, you know, notice what it says. Can a mother walk away from her children that she has born? And the answer is supposed to be no, except that in the circle that we were sitting, some people would say, yeah, that actually does happen. Yeah. My wife walked away from me and the kids, yeah. um, blah, 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 blah. So there were always situations there where that was actually a very real possibility. Yeah. And I think that the, uh, that the prophet Isaiah may have had that in mind also when he says, yeah, in, in a really crazy situation, a mother may in fact walk away from the child she has born. But God has carved you, your name on the palm of his hand. He cannot undo that. Your life, your situation, your, your whole story is always before his eyes. And I would take this little thing, I would put it, in the middle of the group, and I am not sure what that did, but we became a very tight group of 60 people. <laughs> 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 that group grew to be 60 people, and, wow. and, uh, and it was an amazing thing. I had a curriculum. I went through the same curriculum every year, um, six years in a row. Wow. wow. And, uh, yeah, that was, that was an amazing thing. So kind, kind of a Calvinist message right there in the middle of that. That Roman Catholic Church. Yeah, and the priest took notice. So he had me preach twice <laughs> in his church. And it's, a, it's a huge Catholic church. They had, they had 5,000 members, and I did five services. And, and so I got to preach to all these people. I'd never preached to that many people. I know how you feel when you say that, you know, your 50-member 50 50 church is a little different than your 9,000 followers on YouTube. So. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and some irony there that you wouldn't have been allowed to preach in a Christian Reformed church. No, uh, but exactly. But, you know, and, and your life has, you know, when you sent me this, you know, this little salt life story, I thought, no, I, I, I want to, I want to video this. I want to put this on YouTube because there is so much, there is so much of God's work through your life, through brokenness and through, through all kinds of things all kinds of very common 
elements of brokenness that that God just would take. And obviously the yeah. Richard Rohr story came later. People might have a little trouble with the chronology with this. Yeah. But yeah. you know how God over the course of your life just it it's just showed a, up at the right time in the right way. That's right. That's right. So so you're so you're, and I kind of see Jordan Peterson in the same light. Well, say more about that. Well, I mean, I was actually quite serious. I mean, I, 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 I'm known in my present congregation right now as leaning slightly to the left of center when it comes to the Bible. Yeah. And, uh, and so there are some people that, that really don't think that I'm qualified to be an elder. They, uh, you know, my, my, I've been asked, I've been asked, John, um, explain uh, the doctrine of atonement. I says, I can't explain the doctrine of atonement. There's 26 of them. I don't even know which one to pick. So, and, and, somehow, and somehow people understood that to mean that I had given up on the doctrine of atonement. Well, <laughs> I don't know if I have given up on the doctrine of atonement any more than I've given up on the Bible. But the truth of the matter is that somehow these things, I, I, I can't really get as excited about it anymore as a good conservative Orthodox Christian Reformed pastor would. And so... I, I, I sometimes speak a little lightly of those things, and my my view of the inspiration of of scripture and 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 all of that probably has some holes in it. And I have had some very interesting mentors, John John Enns, or Peter Enns would be one of them, and and a few other people. I I, uh, I really like James Kugel's book, you know, on the on interpreting the Bible, and and these are these are not people who readily fall into our narrow little orthodox boundaries you know and i i struggle with that a little bit because i mean you and i have had that conversation how it is important for an institution to have confessional boundaries for it to have any kind of continuity and i respect that and i and i and i i appreciate that and and, and that's even true in my own home church i mean i don't rock anybody's boat i don't go around you know telling people that, that, that they're wrong believing what it is that they believe uh, it's just that for me, it doesn't quite grab me that same way anymore. And so I, I actually had kind of, yeah, I'm, I'd lost a little interest in Bible study and all that stuff. I could think of some other ways that I would, you know, gather people together in, in meaningful ways. I mean, I'm a proponent of listening. Uh, I've, I've, I've had some some opportunities in that sense. But then P Jordan Peterson shows up and, and, and he says, we ignore the Bible at our peril. Well, I don't even know what that means. <laughs> but he's got my attention. <laughs> and so I want to learn with all the other people that are paying attention to that line. And I want to be in contact with them. I, wanna, I want to be surrounded by them. I want to, you know, uh, be in physical contact with them. I want to sit across the table from them and talk about why we ignore the Bible at our peril. Yeah. And I want to hear their story about what brought them back to the Bible. And I want to hear the stories of all the atheists that thought they were done with God and that, and that found themselves in church the following week. No. <laughs> <laughs> I can relate to all these things. So. <laughs> and, and, I, and, I care, and I care very much about the kids that, that get stuck in their mother's basements, the buckos, because the society is too hard on them. I am a rather strong-willed and strong-spoken person. I'm, I'm, I don't, I don't, I'm, I'm, the, I'm the least dismissible person you ever come across. <laughs> I, I, I can hold my own in most conversations, in most contexts, but the world is a cruel place. Life is hard. And I don't think that we do a really good job of preparing, especially young men, for the hardship of life in the real world. So I can easily understand that sometimes, you know, it may seem safer for them to stay in the basement and play video games, but that at some point when reality hits and they want to get out there and, and, and sort themselves out, that is no small thing. And I love all the resources that Jordan Peterson makes available to them. And if I can in any way contribute to that, uh, then I would like to do that very much. And that is also what my passion is for the meetups. 
and uh, and so I, I, I basically have no idea how we're going to pull this off. Paul, we're, we're going to gather three groups of people. It's craziness. We're going to we're going to gather people who are rethinking their view of the Bible. Even some conservative Orthodox people who are saying, "Hey, you know, this guy's onto something," and maybe my conservative doctrine of inspiration uh, leaves something to be desired and needs to be tweaked. So we have that whole category. And then we have people who have kind of uh, parted way th ways with the church or walked away a long time ago or never really had any exposure at all and are saying, hey, you know, this is uh, Sam Harris is losing the argument. <laughs> you got to pay attention to this. You know, what, what, what is this thing about, about sacrifice and about church and about community and about what what is that all about and so they come to a meetup or to jordan peterson with those kinds of questions yeah. and then there is all the the kids the millennials that are trying to sort themselves out and they don't even know where to start and and jordan peterson has has kind of uh given them a little impetus to to clean their room and to get the show on the road and I would like to come alongside of them too. But if all three of these groups of people show up at any one meetup, it'll be chaos. <laughs> I don't know how to sort that out. I'm going to leave that up to you. Well, that's they, they, they do okay together. I know that because I've got all three of those groups. Oh, okay. They do all just right. fine. And, and it's, it was really funny because when, you know, I started talking about Jordan Peterson and voices and John's kind of getting into it. And then I made some videos and I get all these subscribers and it's like, what am I going to do? And John's like, this is great. And he's got a whole plan for me. And I'm like, I'm not sure this is great. And I was like, nah, it's great. Trust me. We'll do something great with it. Start a meetup. And it's like, okay, that sounds okay. And so John has, one of these days, I'm going to do a talk like this with my friend Rod Hugan, because John has plans for Rod Hugan's life too. John <laughs> tends to have plans for our lives. You know, but, um, and John's a, he's not a dismissible guy and he has these plans and he keeps pushing them. And no, you don't, you don't dismiss this guy very quickly. I've learned that. So, um, so we're going to come down to Southern California and we're going to have a conversation. And I really wanted to have this talk because, because I do all these videos and I tell my stories and I do this and people hear me and that'll draw some people over there. But, you know, and people ask me sometimes, they, they say, well, you do you do conversations on your channel with people that nobody knows. And part of me says, well, nobody, I mean, 8,000 people, nobody knows me either, truth be told. But I, I'm a firm believer that God does amazing work in people's lives. And most of these stories are never told. And I think that's a sin. And I want them told and I want them out there. Because I know that there are many, many people that will hear your story and they will connect with parts of it. Now, you've got so many interesting parts, they probably can't draw the whole thing, but they'll connect with parts of it. And God will get in through those parts. And everybody is welcome to ask questions. I mean, I'm, I'd be happy to answer any questions that anybody might have about my, about my journey. But <laughs> So, so we're going to do a meetup together and I, you know, and I, and I look at this too and I think, you know what, John just kind of zoomed into voices and of course, voices is this tiny little listserv that's, you know, kind of like my church, just kind of small and declining and John just zooms in and it's like, well, he, he would be noticed and then, you know, right away. He talked about his, his pilgrimage on El Camino and, and, and all of this stuff. And then the Jordan Peterson thing. And now we started another listserv together. And who knows what God's going to do with this. But you've, you've, John's got big visions for what God's going to do with this, bigger than mine. So <laughs> I don't know about that, but we'll see. Wow. We'll see. We'll see. So we'll be faithful. We've been going. We've been going for an hour and some. So that's probably as much as people can bear, but I'm going to put links in the bottom for your meetup in Southern California and for our meeting that's coming the evening of the 18th. Now, where is that going to be and what time, John? We're going to meet at seven o'clock at Centro Basco restaurant. It's a Basque restaurant that does an amazing uh, taco and various other Basque ethnic foods. And uh, we're going to use the back room. They uh, let us have that. Um, 
for other things that I do there also. And on some other occasion, I may be able to tell you about my story hour uh, adventure. Okay. But um, yeah, we're going to meet at 7 o'clock at Central Basco. It's uh, at 13432 Central Avenue in Chino, California. And uh, the nearest airport is Ontario Airport. If people want to fly in for the occasion, they're welcome to do that. Okay. I'm flying in for the occasion. That's right. Well, if you fly in, why wouldn't anybody else? That's right. That's right. And actually, I'm I'm I've got church business down there, and so that's how yeah. John and I timed it. And I'm so looking forward to this meetup because I I just love doing the meetups because I love meeting all these new people. And I want your entrepreneur friend who uh, lives on the East Coast and who flies around the country anyway. I want him to show up for our meetup too. Well, so you let I him know. Will, I will send him. I will send him an invitation. Very nice. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, John, for this. And I'm just going to, I'm going to stop the video and you and I can chat a few minutes and then, and then I'll let you go. All right. Thank you.